would be a major issue. Narendra Modi himself spoke about that uh, electronic uh, manpower, the EM power uh, that he's been doing from Gujarat. And uh, many similar initiatives have been taken by uh, many of the companies uh, here in India. So when we talk about this uh, sort of diminishing talent pool or the high cost talent that's really happening in India, we perhaps the logical way would be to look at smaller cities and towns, to look at the untapped uh, women workforce, to look at uh, the disabled, and to look at many other avenues. Unfortunately, what perhaps happens is that uh, there are some regulatory challenges, so it's easier said than uh, done. There is perhaps a thinking divide, a mindset problem, where most of these activities are seen as CSR activities. Mm -hmm. Maybe one has to find a way of making it a viable model. And there's always this whole thing about the skill sets. Maybe the kind of skill sets that are found in smaller towns and cities need to be upgraded. There needs to be a lot of retraining, etc. If you look at the figures that NASCOM will be releasing, uh, as far as impact sourcing is concerned, it's supposed to be a dollar 19 million industry as of now, creating something like 6,000 jobs. And I think we've had this conversation saying that it's a little more, but less than 10,000. But then compared to a $118 billion industry with uh, 3 million direct jobs, 9.5 million indirect jobs, and you see that it's a drop in the ocean, but a significant drop. So I would, uh, we simply have uh, experts out here, and uh, we are running a little short on time. I would start with uh, Mr. Raman Roy, who we fondly call the father of the Indian BPO industry. Uh, so Raman, <laughs> <laughs> All of us are children. Oh. That's why I got elevated to grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> so, Raman, uh, I've, I've had this conversation with you earlier also, and I think even in distinctly in 2009, I remember interviewing you on certain topics, where you said that you had done some uh, wonderful pilots for uh, uh, women. You wanted them to work from home uh, in Mumbai and Delhi. And you have also reshaped the entire beauty industry. You gave you are one of those uh, people who uh, gave a lot of vision. Now this is being called as the next gen outsourcing. So uh, you have been uh, you have tried the subcontracting model by working with rural uh, shows in smaller towns like uh, Tamil Nadu, etc. So what's your perspective? I think the the, the opportunity is huge. Uh, you know you. You said 100 billion, actually the way I look at it is uh, that is what is uh, outsourced today as a size of the industry. If you look at what is in-source and what could be outsourced, it's four, five hundred billion. So it's, uh, it's huge. So the opportunity of what can happen is, uh, is mammoth. Uh, for the industry, whether onshore industry or offshore industry, it is up to us as an industry to be able to create a value proposition for for uh, being able to penetrate into that market as an outsourced market. On an offshore basis, uh, again, while India today is dominant as, as the single largest uh, location, the biggest issue, as you said, is uh, the availability of talent. We can get the business, but uh, the availability of talent to be able to meet it and the irony is, uh, you know, we, we are about a million uh, direct jobs, that is uh, white collar jobs, and we, if you take the ratio of one is to three, one is to four, depending on who you talk to, that is about another three million uh, blue collar or light blue collar uh, jobs that, that we end up creating. So those blue and light blue, the supply is mammoth. The aspiration to go from the light blue collar job to a white collar job is huge. But any one of our companies, when we, we start looking for people, we put one ad in the paper or something, we get eight to 10,000 applications, five to 8,000 applications, depending on which newspaper you choose. <laughs> or if you choose the main tip, uh, it works. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but out of that, we recruit barely 100. The question is what happens to the next hundred or the next thousand uh, or the next five hundred. So that is one, one dimension to say because we, here are people who are looking for a job. 
The next dimension is the talent that is available in smaller towns and cities or in rural and we, we have tapped it. We are absolutely delighted with the success of what we have seen. The talent is great for various reasons, social reasons. A lot of talent is unable to move out from their homes, particularly uh, a female colleague or a colleague to be being able to move out, it is not 100%, it is not even 30-40% who are able to move out for their homes and there are social pressures. But again, if you analyze the, the, the academic results that they got, uh, they are yards ahead and therefore they represent a capability. So with the rural aspect, we've taken the work where they are. But training is a challenge. So, uh, you know, the in-service industry, what you need, what is critical in my opinion, is the middle management. So as you go to smaller towns and cities, you go to the rural aspects, the, the availability of middle management is a huge challenge. Add to that the trainer. In my opinion, the model to send a trainer from the city to a smaller town or to a rural area where you go for two weeks, train the people and come back, I don't think that is a viable model. So you need the trainers and you need a robust train the trainer program so that more trainers can come into being and what can happen. If we as an industry get our act together, adding another million or so, give or take a few hundred thousand either way, is in my opinion a non-issue. But some of the challenges are real. And unfortunately, the present model seems to be that the companies have to bear the cost of that challenge of, of upgrading the middle management, of creating the trainers, of creating the facilities, of creating that. So if by some magic, and uh, those of you who heard Mr. Modi talk of CSR and how we can utilize that money, if through some magic some money came into being that could help mitigate some of that cost, I think a catalytic activity will happen because once we reach a particular size and scale, it will get a life of its own. And once it gets a life of its own, it, it, it can be dramatic for creating employment and it can be dramatic for the talent pool availability to the industry. So, Keshav, since you are not uh, sharing the limelight literally, sitting at the fire, uh, this has uh, been exploring uh, some work with the subcontracting model and uh, uh, the father has spoken uh, to the what you have to say. Thanks, Leslie. You know, I don't need the limelight because with this head, it shines off me anyway. <laughs> right? But uh, I actually agree with a lot that you know, Raman spoke about. So we are, uh, you know, we speak a lot. So we, our, our views are very much the same in these areas. But I tell you, 2% of Indian cities deliver 30% or control directly, indirectly 30% of India's GDP. So clearly there is a huge potential, you know, for inclusivity, for, you know, bringing in the gains of business to other parts of, of this country as well. And if you look at numbers from a BPM point of view, we, we already employ 1 million uh, people directly, we have now set this lofty target of 50 billion in exports over the next you know, seven years between now and 2020. So clearly there is a big need for talent and, and, and for high quality people who can deliver all of this. At the same time, as of now, a lot of our tal talent appears to be coming only from the tier one cities. But if you actually look deep into that talent, arguably about 60% of those people working in our industry actually came from tier two, tier three locations, and you know, came to where the work was. Now the model that we are looking forward to is taking you know uh, people the other way. So taking you know work to the people as infrastructure and all of that capital. Kind of so I actually think that this makes tremendous business sense. I, I think the whole CSR uh, area is is secondary, right? It, it is really the whole business area. So if we have to grow the overall industry from 118 billion to 300 billion by 2020, you know, how are we going to do it? How are we, you know, going to actually drive 
uh, you know, the, the, the supply in such a way that we are reaching out to more and more talent pools across this nation and bringing more people you know, in. At the same time, as a, as a council uh, from NASCOM, we recently also did a very interesting study. So again, to back all of this, we've also been doing studies to understand what the behavior also is. And one very interesting and also alarming output that came from one of the studies that we recently did with Nielsen, and I know Nielsen you know, spoke about it, uh, maybe in this summit or the earlier one, was that in the tier one cities, people in our industry are starting getting, are starting to get much more focused now on work-life balance, right? Whereas what we really need is talent who is hungry, who is looking for a job, who is looking to, you know, really uh, make contributions, and who is looking for stretch roles uh, and, and, and career enhancements. And frankly, my own view is that talent is lying in the tier two, tier three location. So I, you will actually see from a business point of view, all of us will make effort to actually dramatically grow down the path. A few of us as companies have already done that. For example, WMS as a company has already, you know, for the last many years, has run a center in Nasik, we're getting, getting into Tinnay Valley, we're getting into so many other locations because it just makes good business sense. But at the same time, we have also experimented with the subcontract uh, sub, uh, sub, uh, model. And uh, I would say arguably at this point in time it works. I think it's a great model. It should work well. Unfortunately, there has to be a lot of branding and communication that we need to do as an industry, particularly with clients. Because for whatever reason, in every contract, the client writes and says you cannot subcontract, right? And whereas on the client side, there's the CEO standing there and saying, you know, I would love to have my project delivered in this fashion from the tier two or tier three locations or from this kind of talent pool. The procurement function that actually helps write the contracts is a very different group of people. So we need to, you know, resolve that. And, and finally, I will also say, uh, let's see that, you know, uh, personally, I am actually ex extremely passionate about a program that you know I'm looking to to drive and uh, and you know actually have the industry uh, you know push through, which is watch them grow. I call it watch them grow, which is we actually think from a BPM council point of view that this business has the ability to create one stable, solid job for every you know farmer of this country, a child of one of the farmers. Not because it is CSR, but because it makes good business sense. Now, there will be a lot of issues in terms of some of the other things like trading, infrastructure, you know, language, all of that. But I think all of that can be overcome. Uh, thank you, Shabh. You, I think you brought up some really interesting points, especially on the uh, SLAs that uh, create some problems and the subcontract model. And also that whole thing about uh, smaller, uh, uh, the bigger companies or larger uh, BPMs trying to, when they're subcontracting, they have to make a business case for you. That, uh, so those are interesting points, but I think that will come in the second round of uh, discussion. Uh, what did you made that, uh, uh, that we are talking, you made that interesting point, saying that the urban youth uh, already, you know, their priorities are different and they perhaps see uh, call center jobs as different, you know, as sort of low end perhaps. So that's also a very significant reason that we have uh, uh, shift. I think there are two, three dimensions. So when we started this industry, I mean, the pyramid is like this. I think the pyramid has to turn completely opposite now, right? So it has to stand on its head rather stand on its base. And when you take the base and you take a different layer of our society and you take a different layer of talent, I think you've got to start driving impact through building that talent and skilling that talent, right? Because you know, everybody went to that top of the cone and the middle of the cone and then we turned the pyramid around you have a very strong base, which is across the country, right? So, interestingly, I met some uh, a group yesterday where they're doing some work on, they have like 600 people and mostly women in, in a town in Karnataka, right? So clearly that has to get built up. I think the biggest challenge we face and we just talked about is, you know, how do you get to that last mile, right? Because you have to go into the tier five city or whatever you want. How do you get to the last mile? You create the right infrastructure to do that. Um, I think customers over a period of time will understand, and a lot of people in this room who interact with customers, whether they are 
consultants or advisors, I think, really, I mean, they can actually drive this for us a little bit. It's excellent. You know, it's not just about what we do in India. And as a company, you know, we hire about 15,000 people globally a year. About 10, about 1,000. This is not a big number, actually, over 15,000, over 7, 8 percent. We hire from or build talent uh, from uh, the, 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 the rural part of the country. So if you, if you go to China, we've done that. If you go to Philippines, we've done a little bit of that, but more in China and India. So really creating a different workforce to get into mainstream. So the challenges are massive in terms of how do you drive training to Raman's point on the delivery engine, how do you drive the, the level of expertise that they need to build. Look, I tell you, uh, it's the resistance is actually within this room. When I tell my team move work from Gurgaon to Dehradun, they, and you know, a lot of folks in Dehradun is a little bit of north of India and towards the hills, so people who are not from the country, they drive massive resistance saying, no, I will not move work to Dehradun. But when you tell them, they are talking to your customer who's moving work from you know, Canton, Ohio, or some place in Leeds in London, then everybody is very excited about it. So we have to find a way of being passionate about this thing. We will take some, some of these jobs and create them in markets where we can get talent. So that's the talent problem we're solving. But from an impact sourcing standpoint, it's also there's a different layer of people where you can invest in. And they are extremely passionate. They want them to be their livelihood, it's their career. I mean, I think you get more loyal customers. And it's, it's, it's really creates a huge impact. And it's not just about that group of people. It's about people with uh, different disabilities, etc. So it's a massive change. So you know, you have to look at a very different pool of people and a very different structure to get that done. Uh, it's, it's tough. I mean, I know uh, in, his, in the National Skills Development Council, there's a bunch of stuff driving skill development at that layer. Right? But you know how much impact we have created. So we've come to that point actually, because that's an that's an important uh, answer. Uh, okay, uh, when talking about the uh, re resistance, I think Accenture has done a lot of work with uh, as far as uh, diversity is concerned, inclusion policy is concerned. Now you're also starting to work with uh, people with uh, disabilities. So could you just tell us how you have managed to take that mindset and get into this? Sure. Uh, a couple of points uh, on this particular part is one is what, what I feel is that this is an area where uh, you know you need to feel from heart, right? Mind will play its own role. And once you play with your heart on this particular part, and then you be a cap of India over and over again, you gotta do a great thing for this country because this will determine your journey. With this thought, you know, the person who started looking into how we can find out, you know, the the guys who are talented, the guys who have the passion, and as we are talking about, uh, you know, they are like hungry. So, so there is a, there's a talent guide who is available there. So we experimented in a couple of locations in India. Uh, neighborhood of Chennai, neighborhood of Delhi, neighborhood of Bangalore, Mumbai, to find out whether this idea or this heart is getting a cap of India really works or not. To my surprise, uh, just in a year's time, we did a some sort of an economic survey, social impact, impact survey with these guys. What I observe is fantastic results. Income doubled. The houses which were not understanding the bank accounts, every company has a bank account now. Houses which were like our temporary structures, permanent houses we built up. Guys are moving with bicycle now having a bike. It's a huge impact that is created because of this particular nature. 45% are women, right? Amazing, you know, it's overall structure, 30%, 30%, you know, somewhere. But in that area, the another lesson that we learn is, is that you we need to come, we need to counsel the only the guy who is hungry to come and join us. We need to counsel the family, the parents, the guys, he or she can do wonders, allow them to do that. And it impacts to so the loyalty, of your, you know, the guy who's there, from the family perspective, is also join us. And because of this, you know, I just wanted to, you know, last point on my thought is that from 
From here, we've seen is guns coming up from you know, various parts of the country like Jammu and Kashmir. Right. The development phase will definitely pick up and it will change the dynamic. And we have seen a wonderful results coming up and saying, guys, I'm there for you, tell me where. Provide them the right skills, put them on the market, bring the family you know, on another counseling platform, you get all the good colors. Uh, you see, uh, your company has been working in ta town centers like Janjipur, Shillong, Guwahati, Shimoga, and uh, but you currently don't think you do any subcontracting. Yeah. So what's been your experience? So I think uh, uh, we, uh, you know, whenever we started looking at a city outside the bigger city, we said we're going to go there with the purpose of actually, uh, you know, uh, uplifting the society uh, and creating jobs for people rather than just looking at uh, it as a place from where we can get cheap labor. So we never said that we're going to give 50% less salary on another location. Uh, we looked at it more from, I mean, we had challenges of getting talent in bigger cities, but we said we'll go to the next city. Maybe we may get a talent uh, at 50% less, but we will give them 80% of what the big cities give. And that's how we will bring the folks to Saigon. And, and, and wherever we have gone, I mean, we've gone as a, in almost 30 uh, locations in India, and very remote we've gone. Uh, we have actually found the quality of talent really better in, in or comparable to the bigger city. We've not really found it. So for example, when we tested Agra, we were very concerned about uh, going from Delhi to Agra, it makes sense. Uh, uh, but but today we are just in about uh, two, two and a half years, we've got about 3,000 people working on Agra. So I think, uh, um, as Sanjeev mentioned, if you're only going with the right purpose, you will you will get what you want to achieve in the cities. But I think what we've also done in the company is looked upon not only uh, just from a talent sourcing perspective, but from a from a larger perspective, that how do you have a shared value with your customer, with your employees, uh, with your investors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, what we've done, for example, and I'm going to give three or four examples just to uh, illustrate that. So, one of the work that we do for a lot of governments across the globe is to manage prisons, and we take over a prison and we manage prisons. And typically, the service levels are that you're you're going to secure the prisoner and you're going to produce a prisoner in front of the court. Etc. Et we actually worked with the government to say that we will actually have a service level to reduce re-offenses by prisoners. So this is the shared value. Now what happens is the government for a period of time is, has actually put this as a service level now. And we start working with the prisoners to ensure that after they're released for a period of time they don't re-offend. Similarly, we did a work on a fleet management company and the whole initial service level discussion was all around uh, delivering goods in time. <laughs> We said, no, we're going to change that. The objective is going to be to save drivers' lives. We're going to reduce the number of accidents at cost. So we will tell people which route to take, which route not to take, from a safety of employees. And the moment the drivers felt that there is somebody taking care of them, they started delivering better returns. So I think, I think those are the things. So for example, in schools, we do a lot of work on schools. And what we've done is not about just getting the schools to operate at a particular price point to ensure that teachers are available, but they're all fine. But how many of those students get into higher education and sustain that education is what we're really looking at. So I think uh, looking across employees, looking across uh, our customers as in clients' customers, and looking at uh, investors, uh, and, and building a kind of a bridge between all the all these uh, 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 parties is, I think, is a sustainable model in long run. As compared to just you know, many times we end up looking at only investors. And most of the initiatives that we do in terms of charity or corporate social responsibility is done because there's a regulation, because somebody has got uh, you know uh, uh, an interest in a particular subject. Uh, but I think those are not sustainable. So, uh, Sandeep, uh, WNS also uh, and uh, uh, Aegis has been uh, working in uh, places like Shri Nagar, Chintwa, Hajira, Ramshedpur, uh, and. Uh, so she made a very interesting comment saying that the talent sometimes is better in the city. So, uh, and also, uh, is it you know the you know, CSR activity? Are you trying to make it this uh, sustainable model? What are the kind of challenges that we are facing? Firstly, I think the interesting part is that some of this perhaps started as a CSR activity, but this works, and today it has become a DNA. It's been ingrained the DNA as far as this is concerned. I'll give you some global examples and I'll come back to the ones that you said in India. In South Africa, we actually tied up with the Rockefeller Foundation, some, something called the Marshi Institute. 
and we set up something called the impact, so Aegis impact sourcing. What it does, for example, it does in Cape Town, it does in Durban, it actually trains people who are, it takes people from unemployed uh, sectors, for example, Soweto in Cape Town, in, sorry, Jova, it trains them, and then Aegis is one of the largest hirings. And we found that this is actually good for us, it increases the talent pool, it gets people who are hungry for jobs, so this has now become not just a CSR activity, but something which is very, very important and useful for agents. Even in a place like the United States, a lot of our centers just happen to be next to very large military bases. In fact, one of our centers is just next to the largest military base in the US. We've hired this year, when I say this year, 2013, 14, 600 people from US Defense Services, which is ex-Army or ex-Defense or their spouses. Now we did that because that was the community, that was the neighborhood. But we found that a lot of these people are mature, they stay for longer time, they're serious at their work. So what started off as an activity, uh, which could be for corporate social responsibility, has now become a, a, an end in itself. It's become a DNA of this thing. So that is something that I would you know, suggest to everybody. And therefore now this Aegis Impact Sourcing Institute, we're looking at in all countries. Coming back to India, Absolutely. We decided many years back to set up a center in Srinagar. And we said that because we said, look, there's no employment there, and this is a huge opportunity. But today we find that center has one of the lowest attritions. I think as some of the other panelists said, people are willing to work, and even on days when there have been trouble, people have turned up, or people have tried to turn up, which would not be there in most other cities. Uh, similarly, Chinwara, we tried that, and we find that both the level, both in terms of attrition, in terms of uh, what we call login, in terms of all the other parameters, uh, people are doing much better. Uh, the other point that we've done uh, is that obviously we can't have a center in every city, but we said, can we do training camps in various cities? We've done just one about last month in Indrapara, which is in Odisha, which is about 50 miles from Qatar, where we've got people together. We said, okay, we will train you. Uh, a lot of them, we said, can come. Uh, to work in our nearest call center. So we're looking at that because that is an easier way. You can't set up centers in every uh, tier 4 or tier 5 cities, but you can set up these camps in these various cities. And the other thing, of course, Leslie, is, uh, you know, we all talk about uh, the tier 3, tier 4, and all these people are talking about the talent, the inverted pyramid, the willingness to work. The other thing, of course, is differently able people. Uh, Aegis got the award uh, recently from the Minister of HRD as, as, as a percentage of people we hire in India from all BPOs, the highest different table. And initially, again, it was as something that we wanted to do, but we find, again, they are more uh, serious, attrition is virtually less, they really want to do the job, so what, it is good for them and it's good for us. So I would say that this is no longer just a CSR, this is something which is good for the companies themselves to adopt and to take forward. Well, typically it's considered very impolite to have the lady speak last. But in this particular case, the lady happens to be from a very reputed research firm. So, Kathy, what's the Gartner perspective on impact sourcing? Uh, thank you. I think it's an excellent point to make, and I think that um, companies, ITO companies need to, to improve the way that they articulate the value because talking to clients just about the labor arbitrage benefits is no longer enough. Being able to talk about the business benefits overall would enlarge the whole pie, as Ram was kind of implying at the start, of the opportunity um, to then have people to be able to employ here in India. So I think overall, um, getting better at the ability to articulate the value of the BPO and the IPO industry over the next few years is um, one of the key places to start to give that opportunity to corporate social responsibility to flow through. The second point I think that's been made that, 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 that stood out for me in terms of um, what needs to happen on the global perspective um, is, is the educating of, of, of buyers, of procurement people, um, as to the importance of including this. And, and the, the sort of the corollary of that would be to perhaps, um, as BPO and IT <coughs> companies, to not accept clients that do not have their own corporate social responsibility as being a client of yours, as being a customer. Mm. That's a little extreme. <laughs> wow. But, but, but think about it, right? I mean, that, that's kind of quite interesting. And what you, what you will find is, um, I'd rather suspect if I went and asked um, the CEOs 
of, of the IPO and EPO companies around the planet, what percentage they've done at work of their clients have corporate social responsibility policy? They must be rather pleasantly surprised. Because this is happening in so many other industries in your client, um, in, the, in the client organization. So to actually do some work to link up with what's important for your customers for their corporate social responsibility policies, I think could be very powerful link, um, both on that, on the, in terms of who the, the BPO and the ITO industry is serving, um, would be terrific, and then also in terms of having that own um, more sustainable corporate social purchasing responsibility within your own um, organizations. Thank you. From the aspects that I guess everybody raised on, on the people side. Let me give you a little story. A few months ago, somebody from rural came in uh, showing me statistics of how his company was training people and in whatever X number of weeks was turning out perfectly employable uh, resources, but the starting point was uh, not up to the standard. My reaction was, okay, take the borderline guys that we are not employing and if you have a secret sauce and you can train them and in X number of weeks they become uh, employable, that is wonderful, let's do it. And uh, he said, I'll think about it. He came back and tried to noodle out of it and say, no, not here, you come to our center and you come and have a look and I'll demonstrate that it works. And in a little while, he was losing credibility with me. Um, over a two, three week period where we were negotiating and then he came in and said, Raman, let me be honest. The guys in towns don't have the hunger to be able to put in the effort that I need to be able to convert them. When I work in villages, they have the hunger. And over a few weeks later, he demonstrated that. So I guess that is the town and city oh, yeah. points that a lot of... Uh, the panelists made. There is a different aspiration level, there is a different level of hunger that, that, that is sitting there. And as an industry, forget as companies of what some of the examples that we gave, as an industry, if we are able to tap that hunger, it can be magic. There's one more uh, point that uh, I'll invert the pyramid back from what Mohit inverted it and I'll bring it back to look at the industry. If you look at the evolution of us as an industry. Very few people were involved when uh, we, we created what we created for American Express and uh, GE, what used to be called Jekis at that time. The issue of what stuff we would bring into India was very real. At that point of time, our ability to go and tell a customer that whatever these 3,000 employees are doing, we will do it out of India, was very limited because we had nothing to demonstrate. Today, we are 20 years into that industry, we are doing whatever, 10, 15 billion dollars worth of it, and we are proudly able to say, whatever it is, we will do it. I mean, don't even tell me what it is, and I'll, I'll show you how I can do it from here. But at that time, there was a need to disaggregate the process, Take the lower end piece of the work and then bring it to India So, because we had to create the middle management, we had to create the training, we had to create the metrics of what had to be measured, we had to work the handoffs of how it was handed off to us and how we handed off back. We seem to have forgotten that learning because it is that learning that we have to relive. A lot of you sitting in this room, I need a lot of people to come and say, I don't know how you have so many guys working in rural. We tried it, it didn't work. You tried it because you took the entire process that you have in a town and city where there is a particular level of education for the employee, where there's a particular level of trainer, where there's a particular level of mid management, there's a particular level of technology, there's a particular level of senior management, etc., where you could manage and you dumped it at the deep end of the pool without any support. In India, if we had done that 20 years ago, this industry wouldn't have happened. And we have to relive that of disaggregating the process, maybe get some of the companies that are working on, uh, on the, the, the rural aspect to help disaggregate. That is a different talent, that is a different capability. 
we need to build that capability so that we take the low end to start with five years later it may be a totally different story so don't look at it to take the process that is there because the low end process that companies think of is low revenue process it doesn't mean it's a low complicated process so you pick up something where you're not making money and say let's take it to a smaller town because that way i'll make money but you forget that it is to do with complexity it is not to do with the per unit revenue that you're making today if you disaggregate it i think your chances of success will dramatically increase and that will create jobs it will, it will do wonderful things uh, to the country and to your company just that point quality aspects and impact. So we did a, just to understand, like Accenture drives globally, performance is like highly performance deliver, forget about that. It's, it's hardcore, you have to perform really, very well. And the performance of those guys was matching exactly the way the performance of the, all the other employees in Accenture around the world. So you, I cannot differentiate a guy saying that, oh fine, you come from that part of the world or this part of the you know, area, the performance I can discount by 20%, no, sorry. They say, no, don't, don't discount me. I'm going to give you more than 100%. But Just that, to worry about it. But that too perhaps happen at uh, maybe a certain level, uh, maybe what's the experience with the middle level managers? Because I think Keshav, you pointed out the uh, middle level management. So there, it's a problem of finding managers at that uh, target in the smaller terms. Again, I'm going to make my boring point of it has to make good business sense. And, and nothing else. Because you know, to Kathy's point, uh, Everyone's point, everybody's point. Uh, we have no choice. We have to get this done. And all of us, uh, at least from a WMS point of view, <coughs> if you look at the kind of clients and processes being serviced from some of these locations, they are not low end processes and they are not domestic business owners. They are the topmost brands in the world that are being serviced you know, from these locations. And my clients actually spend five hours in the car, you know landing in Bombay and going to some other place, they have no interest in meeting me. They would rather be there because that's where the, the work gets done from. I think the challenge is, you know, is, is, is different. So one is, of course, this whole thing of how do we, uh, you know, take the border deeper. The other challenge is more social in nature, if you ask me. And it is because, you know, all of us are trying to choose locations in these tier two, tier three locations where we also have a first mover advantage, right? Because we are competing, right? So we're trying to find that first mover advantage in those locations. Uh, we are therefore experimenting. Compensation levels are the same. So there's, it's a myth that you can pay somebody lower. You, know, you can't do that. It's the same. But experience has shown that based on what uh, is actually available there as an industry, influence from other industries hit our industry. So for example, I'll give you a, a simple example. If you go into a location and create a business process center or maybe an IT you know, kind of a services center and you're the only player there, it is quite possible that your competition really are all the big manufacturing companies, the, you know, the auto companies, the people like that, and the influencers of the people you are employing are telling them, you should actually tell the children your negotiation with a WRS or a GenPack or someone, you know, should be around a, a three-year compensation cycle. So are you, you know, are you uh, planning your, your salary uh, discussions and all? Like as if you are not from the knowledge business, but from the benefit. You see, that is the biggest danger. So. That is one. And therefore, there is a big responsibility of the government, both central and state, to get involved and you know, help us you know, cross this challenge. So one of the things we are doing, and in fact, we discussed this recently at the NASCOM BPM Council uh, in, in, in Delhi with Chandra, was how do we make state governments, I mean, my view is they should actually compete like hell with each other for our business, right? And we would like to actually put a list of which are the better states and which are the laggards in terms of some of these things. And of course, you know, uh, advice keep coming back was that let's not do it that way. Let's employ somebody like a Cathy or you know somebody from one of the big consulting firms to in a proper way 
allow the governments to understand that this is an expectation, and, and therefore you then find some way of ranking and, and then use that in the model. So I would say that these are some more challenges that we have to get past. Do we want to do the business and move it in? Absolutely. Can we do it overnight? Not yet. Okay, very quickly. How do you take it from a CSR model to a sustainable business? I think, uh, I think we started off saying you know, it's not just a CSR. It's a, it has to be sustainable. This is looking at a different workforce, the impact sourcing stuff we all talked about. It's a reality. I mean, if we don't do it now, I think companies who don't do it actually are going to uh, it's going to hurt them as we go forward. It is actually for us, it is a very structured program on what we call is, you know, building skills and, and really what we call the make factory and really making talent. And, and we have to do that for our survival. So see, uh, building skills, very, very important uh, ingredient as far as this making it a sustainable environment. How are you specifically? Uh, they said uh, <coughs> what we're doing is uh, in, in a lot of smaller cities that we've gone, we've actually worked with uh, the universities, the colleges, etc. Mm -hmm to incorporate into their curriculum things which will give a benefit to the people coming out of those colleges on a sustained basis rather than just focusing on what is the benefit for us as a company being located there. And I think that's where people start realizing that this is just not a company which is coming with a selfish motive, it has got a shared value. And as you rightly said, uh, it's just not a social responsibility but a shared value. Where we are saying that we could be a starting point for you to do a job but we will make a banker out of you to go to a bank. We will make a hotelier out of you to go to a hotel. And our intention is not to keep getting you to you know, do the same thing here for life. And, and many times we run education programs or skill development within the company. Those programs actually lead to employees being better than what they're required in the company and they leave it was. But I think over a period of time, people realize that this company is actually genuinely interested in, in development of people. And, and that enables us to get a lot of time. So, as Keshav said, we do compete with manufacturing companies. In a lot of cities where we go, there is no BP or no IT companies. But when they realize that this company is coming with a different value, uh, which is good for us in this, on a long-term basis, they, they do come and want to work for us. And your perspective on the same topic? I think it's three things are important. If you really want to get this point, I think companies are interested. As you saw in this panel, a lot of companies feel it has become an intrinsic part of their business, shared values, sushi and pork. But I think you need three things to really make it a successful. You need buyer blessings. So the buyers have to also understand, the people who are giving the business, that this makes sense. Kat has talked about it. Maybe it's the analysts, it's the community which can make it perhaps better. Second is infrastructure. Each of part about somebody traveling three, four hours, but if the road is so bad and it takes so much time, most buyers will not want to go. So that infrastructure has to help. And third is support. One of the things that we've gone to various governments and said, look, not only we will set up a center, but if you give us land, we will set up a hostel for these people to stay because you've got to enable the infrastructure to do it. Some governments are more proactive, others are less. So if we have an ecosystem which works in terms of buyers, in terms of infrastructure, and in terms of supporting companies, I think the companies, not just of this panel, but otherwise, will make impact things far stronger and far more effective as we go through. Just as going green was a fad at one point in time, perhaps impact sourcing will shake off this whole thing about CSR and get into a viable business model. I can see that there are plenty of intelligent people in the audience too who would love to ask some questions. So I would so open this discussion now. Uh, to one me. point, Leslie, okay, I okay, think it was something that did not work. Because I, I think newer models are required as we go into the smaller town. <coughs> Here is something that I regret to report did not work or we were unable to implement it. When we came up with this idea that where are buildings in the smaller uh, villages, towns, etc., and we found schools. So, that's interesting. They have electricity, they, 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 they have rooms, they have everything. And there are schools which uh, finish after the midday meal. And we came up with a program to go to the school and say, we'll give you computers, we'll put 50 computers in the rooms, during the day, uh, when you teach, the kids can use it. After school, we can use it and we can run it. We have a ready infrastructure. We, we were unable to implement. I mean, the story, you, 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 you spoke about uh, the management uh, reaction. Uh, uh, I 
I think Mohit spoke about that, uh, the management resisting. The school management here resisted putting free computers that the kids could use and in return allowing the use of the school after 2 o'clock into till the next morning. But again, the, the point I want to bring out is there are newer models that have to be done. You don't have to set up centers, you don't have to set up the capabilities and we need to put our brain power to work on finding those models. Because if they kick off, it can be huge for, for that community. But, so we'd like to uh, I can see plenty of hands, so we start with the, kindly identify yourself and if your question is directed at any specific person, please say so. This is uh, Venkatesh from Northern Trust Fund, uh, based in Bangalore, here in India. And all of you guys have spoken very well. Your English is just impeccable. <laughs> so the, one of the questions that I have is when you go into the tier 3 and tier 4 cities, you have very smart individuals you can hire. But one of the biggest challenges in India is communication. That has been one of the hardest things. How do you get over that? And none of you spoke about that. So I think uh, it's not about, uh, when you when you do look at what the Raman is, right? So you take certain type of work into a certain city, right? Do you put high volume, massive, all center in, in uh, Chindwara or there, you want right? a global process. What will you do? You will do transaction process. You will do FNA basic transaction work. A bunch of other stuff, right? What do you need? You need to train. The, 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 the element of training, the, the time to train is two times of what you will train. Because what are you doing? You're putting in templates to train people on structuring to write an email. You're creating templates to the block, right? These people are not interacting at that, that level. They're not interacting every day with a customer or with your client. I mean, they have supervisors who are doing that. So I think for them, it's very important that it has to be a, a, a certain skill set which they are good at, which they can apply. So can they develop over a period of time? Absolutely. So I think it's, 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 the, it's the question of how you think about your solution and how you think about what they need to get done. It's, it's a little bit of saying, this is my, my raw talent, this is what they're good at, and this is what I'm going to make them do. I'm not going to make them do a voice call to talk to some customer in America. No way. Right? So you've got to find a way. IT. I mean, why won't they, why, if they can play with IT, look at IT companies, you have to look at IT. Not even 10% of the people face the customer, 90% are sitting in a room, you know, punching keys or whatever they're doing. They don't interface with the customer. You've got to find the right solution for it. I don't think so, it's for body I think that answers your question. The next question. Thank you so much for the great talk. Uh, my question is, is, is to anyone in the panel, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Yeah. Is it all the way in the, the back? Oh, okay. yeah. I work for the software services company in Pakistan, and my question is to anyone in the panel, that population size from Pakistan to here is one to, uh, one to six. But the size of the services, the ratio of services, one to 100 or maybe more. So I was just wondering if somebody has comments that what, why is that? Okay, could you please uh, repeat the last part of the question? So, uh, so, uh, so, so my question was that the population ratio between here and Pakistan is so six to one. But the size of the services, like the ratio of services, is 100 to 1. So there's a huge, huge difference there. Something is going wrong, wrong over Pakistan. But there's so much difference. I, I, I think there are two three reasons. You know, uh, India, for example, uh, really got into this uh, EPO map, services map, uh, for example, because of uh, GE, because of uh, American yeah. Express. Similarly, when some, some large firms came into the Philippines, Philippines came into the map. You've got to have a critical mass of big firms doing services work for that critical mass to happen. Today, in fact, uh, Philippines on the voice side is as big or if not bigger than India. Philippines population is uh, even smaller than the population of Pakistan. But why has it happened? It's happened because large <coughs> international firms went there, saw that the service was good, built up a critical mass, and then 
the, the thing kind of had a ratcheting effect. And therefore, that is necessary. So if a lot of large, big firms, whether it's from the US, whether it's from other countries, go to Pakistan, build that critical mass, and then the multiplier effect will happen automatically. India, of course, has a, has a secondary thing because it has a strong domestic market. There is also a lot of people from the domestic service industry for large telecom and banking firms. But I think the big reason, and I give the example of Philippines because that will answer your question on population, is because big firms, when they created that message that yes, Philippines is a good place for customer support, then there is a multiplier effect, which is growth. And I would just add that there, been, there are enough examples of other countries that have the same experience. You look at Ericsson and Nokia for years from these small little countries, they hammered the rest of the world, right? It's just a case of who did what better, faster. But again, I, I do think that the, 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 the small or a distributed model is a model. As yet, a lot of people are experimenting with it. Uh, but in my younger days, I used to be you know, in economics, uh, shoemakers, uh, shoemakers, so small is beautiful. And at that time, it was a bit of a rage uh, that small is beautiful and that is a different business model. I think in smaller towns and cities, creating large centers, you will never have a 5-10,000 seat uh, center that is sitting in uh, a tier 5, as we call it. You need to have multiple 250 seat centers. But how that business model will work, we have to learn. I, I, I don't think it has been <coughs> successfully implemented yet. I, I also don't think that that is not a model. I think some very smart people need to work on it and, and find out what makes that model work. Another point, another point of this is that you, you have a, today it's not the same thing that every geography can have the same services and then say, if I'm I X country, India can do, I can also do, right? No, it's not today. The skills available in that particular geography is now becoming the power of attraction. While Sri Lanka is now coming up on the map, right? As compared to the other countries in South Asia. The reason is because they've identified a unique skill that they have and then permit that skill token the world map, why we want these type of work and these skills are here. Something could be gone on the side. I'll just take that question. I have a question here. No, no, just one second. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Hi, my name is Neeraj Jolwani. I run a company called B2R, which is an impact sourcing service provider in the hills of Uttarakhand, up in the foothills of Himalayas. Uh, many of you have spoken of uh, the challenges and the opportunity we talked of buyer behavior, we talked of disaggregation, we talked of training, we talked of subcontracting clauses, we talked of selling the pyramid up and down both. What is the one thing that would this panel recommend, and I'd, I'd appreciate different views if there are many, the one thing that impact sourcing providers can do, the one big thing, I know there are many things, the one thing that large corporations like yourselves could do, and the one thing that government can do to turn this from 9,000 people today employed across the country to 90,000 and 900,000 and, and the tipping point of what we are visualizing can really happen. What are those one thing each? If you say the many, of course, what's the one big thing for ISSPs, for large PPOs, and for government to do? I'd appreciate the panel view. I guess, uh, I guess it will market. Yeah, I would, so I'm assuming that you're taking care of all the other things already. <laughs> <laughs> but the one thing... So out of would, them, the most important one is what I mean. I, I would say the most important one as we go down this model, which I would want all of you to focus on, and that's why we're getting we're saying that the government say is to make sure that the political parties stay out of this business, allow it to be run as a knowledge business, do not get employees or potential employees to come in and start discussing long-term agreements, like as if it's manufacturing. These are not laborers, these are knowledge people, and I would say that is the most important, because all of them, as we go down this model, are looking at starting to influence this. And this is one business that has never been impacted by you know, trade unions, trade unionism, and things like that. And that, I would say, is the biggest risk. And potentially, if we handle it well now, will not be us. That's a tough call. You're looking for a push from the government, and then a change, and it's not going to uh, the other two, please, if there is, you, you talked about keeping politics out. For the large PPOs themselves, what is the one big thing that they could do? Could you take that policy? And the ISAC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, anyone of you. I have a question. Oh, uh, I have an observation first. 
I see that you are extending your current business model the way you are looking at moving from tier 1, tier 2, all the way to tier 4, etc. You will keep doing that. It makes a lot of business sense. I don't dispute it. What is it that fundamentally you are thinking that makes sense from a social economic standpoint? Because what I see is an inside-out perspective. It's going to make business sense. You will get a client approvals. You will disaggregate the processes. All of that is well and good. What's the impact you're going to measure? Where is the outside in view towards the social economic impact, which is why a government would listen to you in the first place? I see an extension of an existing model. I mean, look, I start with financial inclusion now. I mean, when you the impact you will create in that environment is you are actually creating financial inclusion. You get one person, right? One person in a household in Uttarakhand or any other city part of this process. Imagine the ripple effect it creates to another three people in that environment. That's the impact you're creating. I mean, the, it, to Kesha's point earlier, it has to make business sense, right? I mean, a lot of us sitting here would do, will create impact, but the impact has to, you know, you can, so I have this big debate with it, that's what I'm saying. We keep on doing <laughs> skill development, skill development, and Jammu Kashmir does this, and that state does that. They create skills, but do they, do, does, an, does an employment get created? I mean, it's, our job is just not to create a skill. Our job is to create employment and drive financial inclusion. As you drive one person in the household, financial inclusion, you will have three more around in that area, in that community, who will be wanting to do that. It's such a, I mean, it's, it's like a magnet, right? It just attracts. I think that's the impact. And that's the way we should look about things. I agree. But I mean, I'll just add to that. There are different ways to cut the same story. <coughs> I don't think it is just the commercial sense and forget yeah. all the rest. So when you approach the government, you tell them of the jobs created. When you approach somebody, a politician who can get votes, you talk of that one family member that is important. When you go to your investors, you talk to them about how you're taking out costs and how it is more profitable. So there are various slices that you cut this cake in and you look at it differently and it <coughs> is it is that skill of understanding different dimensions and being able to ma manage those multiple dimensions that is critical to make this succeed. It is not one or the other. Okay, I would have taken more questions, but in the interest of time, we'll have to call it a day. Uh, you, you can take two more questions. Okay, we can take two more questions. Permission granted. Can I, can I, can I, can I excuse me? There's three microphones. Can I take two microphones? Uh, hi, uh, my name is Ravi. I run a company called OnTrack and uh, four of the six companies represented here are my clients, so I presume I know a little bit about them. Now, I just thought I'd give a bit of perspective out here. We are very excited about one million employment, four million indirect blue collar, etc., etc. Uh, if I were to take the example of one other industry and talk about the textile industry, we employ 35 million people. The scales are different. If I were to take the revenue of one company, Accenture, it is way more than the entire BPM industry as of today in India. So we are talking about a completely different scale out here. So I think the issue becomes more about ambition in terms of what do we really want to do. If we want to, <coughs> to get, the question is, the question, I'm coming to the question. The question is, we have been talking about how do we take our existing work to all of these people in you know, various parts of India. But I want to know from the panel, what are we doing at the selling end? How do we map the work that we are going to sell to the talent that is already available? So there is talent available, they can do a certain type of work, but are we doing the right selling? Since you mentioned Accenture. <laughs> <laughs> Only because. <laughs> no, I think uh, you know, the client is very happy to look into the larger town, you know, and say, oh guys, you know, India, okay, my bad job. India, maybe you're not even the center of bus. It's a, it's a matrix which works both ways. From the government side, what are the infrastructure facilities available in a particular location? What is the uh, talent pool, skill pool which is available? And apart from that, the convincing power of us to the clients who are serving is saying that we can also look into these geographies and XYZ other parameters might make sense for us. For us, we first of all get convinced because of the government initiatives and the infrastructure and, and etc. etc. and then try to convince the client. We have been seeing uh, earlier about huge amount of resistance, not looking into any other towns. But today, when we talk about convincing powers and the way we can approach, you know, for example, the respective state, I think you have the delegations to the Europe and 
and US and talking about their particular initiatives in that, in, in that particular state. So there's some momentum that you see in the, uh, on the globe. And then you try to convince them. It, nowadays, it's become a little bit easier, a little bit easier, not so in terms of taking a fight. Okay, fine. Whatever you decide, you have it. Not the case. But at least some momentum is there. I think, you know, I'd like to give you comfort also. This group of people and people sitting outside this room have taken out a $300 billion target. What do you mean we're not selling? <laughs> we are selling and we're actually saying we are going to, we, are, we need to drive this model even further to complete that. And I have a question for you. Who are the two villains of this panel who are not your plan? I think they're all plan. Sorry, sorry. Uh, this is one of your one point. You talked about the last numbers. It's easier, we all, you know, a lot of clients here, a lot of companies here do a lot of domestic business, which is easier to uh, convince clients, a lot of that is growing, but it also answers this question. One big thing which will add to this huge population is using these to work for the government. We are working for one government for initiatives of e-governance, of normal civic sanitation. We are employing about 9, 900 people for that. If we do more, itself we can add 20, 30,000 people. So the question they ask, they ask impact sourcing, what can happen? Can we use all these initiatives to make governance easier? We can go to those areas, we can do the financial inclusion that Mohit talked about, and we can add to the numbers. Give the lady the last word. Oh, thank you. I think one of the things that makes a terrific difference is to focus in on making these jobs sound more like careers. And, and when we've been talking about upskilling people, we've talked about Sri Lanka. The reason that Sri Lanka has done terrifically well is because it has more seen the, the you know, chartered accountants. It, it's focused in on giving people, um, helping people understand that a career, having skills in a particular area is important. So rather than talking about generic um, industry, generic processing, I think it's been much, it's, it's, it's time over the next five to ten years um, for, for, for this industry to kind of tweak and become more like standalone um, uh, focused in on particular areas like finance and accounting, um, advertising, marketing, and to actually um, uh, uncover all the different fantastic things that are happening here with the very skilled people and make sure that the world understands that this isn't just a transaction, this isn't just a voice or non voice, and as it gets obsessively called here, it really is a whole series of different careers and, and, and activities and skills that have been done very well um, from different locations. So I'll take this opportunity to thank the audience for enriching this uh, discussion with your interaction. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank this amazing panel and the for moderating so many experts on this stage. Before we close, and I know we've got the, the next speakers that are ready to come on stage and, and do the, the next session, we've actually just written a report um, with a lot of help from the Rockefeller Foundation, from Castling Consulting, and others. Um, and it'd be great if we could sort of formally launch it here and uh, thank everyone. This report actually goes deeply into the area of impact sourcing service providers. So talking about the companies like Peter, uh, who gave us the question from B2R, and really giving um, and really giving a little more insight into what it is that everyone has done in the, um, in the, in the industry. So if we could just do a quick picture. Like this. Okay. And I'm going to get up there. But then you take the reports back, or do we get them? No, you get them. <laughs> when you get them. It's to important, them. right? So <laughs> don't have the <laughs> there we go. Thank you so much. We have gifts, but I want to go ahead and take them to the stage. But thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.